This time, let's uh, stand. Let's dismiss the children to Children's Church. We're going to sing one of those newer songs, That's Why We Praise Him. Um, on this one, it does break into parts at, the, at a chorus uh, down there. And so uh, I'll try to lead in with each of those, so try to help you remember a little bit if you don't. So... He came to live, live a perfect life. He came to be the living word, our light. He came to die so we'd be reconciled. He came to rise to show his power. And that's why we praise him. That's why we sing. That's why we offer him our everything. That's why we bow down and worship this king. Cause he gave his everything. Cause he gave his everything. He came to live, live again in us. He came to die, to be our conquering king and friend. He came to heal and show the lost ones his love. He came to go. Prepare a place for us, and that's why we praise him, that's why we sing, that's why we offer him our everything, that's why we bow down and worship this king, cause he gave his everything, cause he gave his everything. Hallelujah, hallelujah, tenors. Hallelujah, hallelujah, altos. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Together, that's why we praise him. That's why we sing. That's why we offer him our everything. That's why we bow down and worship this king. Cause he gave his everything. Cause he gave his chorus again. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, that's why we praise him, that's why we sing, that's why we offer him our everything, that's why we bow down and worship this king, cause he gave his everything, cause he gave his everything. Amen, great job, please be seated. Well, good morning. I feel like this is Christmas. I have twice as long. I don't know what happened. I have like twice as long to preach this morning. The announcements are really long. Oh, is that it? Tonight is trivia night. I hope that uh, you are planning on coming back for trivia. Oh, my goodness. Last week it got serious. I thought there was going to be mutiny. Uh, tonight, I have toughened the questions. So small, group, small groups are in competition. My group, by the way, is in the lead. I should say the group that bears my name. I'm not in it. I just have some smart people in my group. Uh, they all do. They all do. Never. Never. I do keep score, though. F five o'clock this evening, bring your favorite snack. Downstairs, we will have trivia night. If you have a Bible, open to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I have discovered something very profound, and that is life is hard. Anybody agree? Amen. Life is hard. It's often disappointing. You notice that? Things fall apart, things go wrong, plans don't happen, even what you pray for. Sometimes that doesn't take place. 
A lot of times we're praying for something, we want it to happen in a certain way, and it doesn't happen that way, and our prayers aren't answered the way we wanted. So a lot of people, after a major loss or a major failure, they just kind of hide inside themselves. They go into a shell. They kind of isolate themselves and basically just determine, hey, my life is over. And they stop living and just, they just exist. They kind of put in the time and wait for it all to end, but they're not really living anymore. But on the other hand, there are some people, no matter what life throws at them, they just get back up, get right back into the game. They have amazing resilience. You knock them down, they get back up. Knock them down again, they get back up. And they even do better than they did before. Well, Paul was a guy like that in the Bible. He had amazing resilience. He had the amazing ability to keep on keeping on when everybody else felt like giving up. You know the passage well. 2 Corinthians 4, beginning with verse 8. We are pressed on every side by troubles, but we're not crushed and broken. We are perplexed, but we don't give up and quit. We're hunted down, but God never abandons us. We get knocked down, but we get up again and keep going. What an incredible passage. Where do you get that kind of resilience? Because I want it. I, I, and I want you to have it. Where do you get the kind of courage to keep on going when every bone in your body just wants to give up? It wants to throw in the towel. You say, I've just been hurt too many times. Forget it. I'm putting a wall around my life and I'll just hide inside these walls. And the problem is when you build a wall to keep the pain out, you also keep love out and you end up existing, not living. So this morning, I want us to look at how you have the courage to keep on going. Specifically, I want us to look at what you do when you feel like giving up. Now, the classic passage on this is the book of Job. So now that you've seen 2 Corinthians, let's find the Old Testament book of Job. It's the oldest book in the Bible. You know the story. Job was, if not the wealthiest, one of the most wealthiest people on earth. He was one of the most prominent men on earth. And in one day, in one 24-hour period, his entire life falls completely apart. In the first place, he lost all of his wealth. And he lost all of his flocks, all of his cattle, his farm. Everything was destroyed. And one day, he lost his children. Murdered by terrorists the same day. Boy, you think you've had a bad day. Job had a Ph.D. in pain. He knew what it was like. He had a Ph.D. in loss. So I want to tell you, no matter what you go through, I'm not downgrading or belittling what you're going through, but it is nothing compared to what Job went through. In one 24-hour period. And yet from his life, we learn some things to do. So when you feel like giving up, when you feel like, I don't have the energy to go even one more step, I'm just going to quit. I'm going to give up on my job. I'm giving up on my dream. It's over. I'm done. Let me give you some things that Job did that I think will help you as well. So let's look at it. Here are four things, if you're taking notes, four things that Job did in his life it's how to, keep the, uh, how to have the courage to keep going when you feel like giving up. You have a major loss. The first thing you need to do is this. Number one, tell God exactly how you feel. He's big enough. He can take it. Tell Him. Lay it on Him. Just give it to Him. Vent. Get it all out. Unload your feelings. Release all your frustrations. Maybe you don't realize it, but when you trust God with your negative emotions... It is actually an act of worship. In the very first chapter of Job, after everything falls apart in his life, this is what he says, verse 20. Job stood up, tore his robe in grief, shaved his head, then he fell to the ground and he worshiped. What's he doing? He's physically, visibly expressing his pain to God. He stands up, he tears his robe, You've got to be pretty mad to start tearing your own clothes. 
He tore his robe in grief. He shaves his head. That's an act of humility. And he begins to worship. Anytime you go through a major loss in life, a major disappointment, you're going to experience at least three emotions. The first is anger. Why is this happening to me? That's the natural reaction. We get angry. And the second thing you have is grief. What have I lost? And the third is fear. What, what happens now? And when you have these three things, anger, grief, and fear, what am I supposed to do with them? Well, you give them to God. You express them to God. That's the first thing you do. You don't suppress it. You don't repress it. You confess it. You tell God how ticked off you are. And you know what? God can handle it. He's big enough. He's strong enough. And He cares. God can handle your anger. He can handle your frustration. You know why? Because He gave them to you. And, and, and I know sometimes, and I, and I was raised in, in kind of church settings that, that really suppressed emotions. And I've always asked myself, why? God is an emotional God. And He gave us emotions. And when we show emotion, we're more like Him. I have a class that I call The Christian and His Emotions. We're going to do that one one day. And, and it teaches us, if you really want to be like God... Use your emotions. He gave them to you for a reason and a purpose. The only reason you have them is because you're made in His image. And He is an emotional God. He has feelings. You know that, right? The only reason you get sad, because God gets sad. The only reason you get angry is because God gets angry. His patience is tested. And he understands all these things. He's an emotional God. He can handle whatever you have. He's bigger than your emotions. So it's okay to tell him exactly how you feel. If you prayed for a promotion and it didn't happen, if a loved one walks out of your life and you've been betrayed, maybe rejected, you, you've dreaded, you've dreaded what happened. Uh, maybe you got a call and said, it's cancer. It's okay to tell God, God, I'm mad, I'm angry, I'm frustrated, I'm ticked off. He can handle it. He handles your questions, He handles your doubts, He handles your grief. He's bigger than you ever realize. The thing I love about Job is he's just brutally honest. He just gives it to God. He doesn't mince words. Job chapter 7 and verse 11. After he had lost everything all in one day, he says, I can't be quiet. I'm angry and bitter. I have to speak. I have to talk. I have to get it out. In other words, if I don't speak, I'm going to pop. When you have negative emotions in your life, if you swallow your emotions, your stomach keeps score. Ask me. I know. If you don't talk it out to God, you're going to take it out on your body. So to have all the emotions, like you just had a major disappointment, you spent all your money building a business, and it goes bankrupt. I prayed for this. I asked God to bless it. What's going on here? You're angry. You're upset. It's like shaking up a Coke bottle. If you don't express it to God, it's going to come out sideways, and it's going to hurt you in the end, somewhere down the road. Job says, I can't be quiet. I'm not, I'm not bottling this up. I'm angry. I'm bitter. I have to say something. And if you study the book of Job, it starts out with confusion. Why is this happening? He doesn't understand. He doesn't get it. Why is this happening? I don't like it. And God just takes it all. God handles it. And the right response to unexplained tragedy is not to grin and bear it. Some people think everything goes wrong in your life. You're just so, supposed to say, praise the Lord, I'm happy today. That's not the way it's supposed to be. That's insincere. That's fake. It's false. God wants you to be authentic with Him. He's not looking for pious platitudes. He's interested in your honesty. Now, I know this is going to shock you. It may surprise you, 
But sometimes my children questioned my judgment. That's never happened to you, right? It may surprise you, but sometimes my children question my judgment. My kids never doubted I loved them, but they didn't always think I was right. They never doubted that I was, I've been on this planet longer than them, but sometimes they questioned my wisdom. God knows that we sometimes question His. He would rather have you wrestle with Him in anger than walk away in detached apathy. Wrestling is a contact sport. Ask Jacob. He wrestled with God. God doesn't mind uh, wrestling with Him as long as you're up front. As long as you're honest with Him, He would much rather have your doubts and fears and confusion than for you to walk away in apathy. Our brother just read for us Lamentations chapter 2. This is what it said. Cry out in the night. Pour out your heart like water in prayer to the Lord. Amen. When was the last time you cried out in the night? When was the last time you poured out your heart like water to God? In the Bible, there are so many examples of godly people frustrated with God and they show it to Him. And God handled it. Jeremiah, for example, God, you deceived me. I think you lied to me. God handled it. Naomi, call me bitter because God has made my life bitter. She came around, but at the moment she was frustrated with God and she poured it out to him. Same thing with Job. Now he questioned God's wisdom and wonders and, and everything that was going on and he admitted his frustration but he still trusted God. That's the first step. Get it all out. Number two. The second thing you're going to do is accept help from others. You need to accept help from others because God doesn't intend for you to handle all the pain, all the loss in your life, all by yourself. We are wired for each other. We need each other. The first thing in the Garden of Eden, God said, it's not good for man to be alone. We're wired for each other. We're wired to be in relationship. But here's the problem. When you go through a major disappointment, you don't want to tell anybody. You want to keep it inside. You want, to, you want it private. You want to bottle it all up. I don't need anybody else. You want to keep it secret. You've had a loss, a failure, a crisis. You pull in and isolate. That's a bad idea. God says, no, let somebody know so they can help you. Job chapter 6, verse 14. When desperate people give up on God Almighty, their friends at least should stick with them. Do you have a good friend? Somebody you can call on. Somebody you can say, hey, look, I'm going through some tough times. The NIV says it slightly differently. It says this, Even a despairing man deserves the devotion of his friends, even if he forsakes Almighty God. In other words, there will be times in your life when you're hurting so much, you might even say, I don't even believe in God right now. I'm so angry, I don't believe in Him. And that's when your friends come along and say, It's okay, we got you, we'll believe in Him for you. We're going to be there for you. We are with you. We're going to help you through this. It's one of the reasons I like small groups. Because you have a, a, a set of friends that are always there. 1 Thessalonians 5.11 says, Encourage each other and give each other strength. That's a command, not a suggestion. Another passage says, by helping each other with your troubles, you obey the law of Christ. What's the law of Christ? Love your neighbor as yourself. When you, uh, uh, by the way, that's said about seven times in Scripture. That's the law of Christ. We're commanded to help each other. I'm doubting, I'm frustrated, I'm upset. It's okay. I'm believing God for you right now. I'm with you. I'm right here. Number three. Trust God 
in the things that you don't understand. That's step three. Trust God in things I don't understand. The fact is, God always answers prayer. He may not answer it the way I want Him to, but He always answers prayer. It's either a yes, a no, a maybe, a wait a while. There's all kinds of ways He can answer. For 37 chapters in the book of Job, Job is asking why questions. Why, God? Why is this happening to me? Why is this happening? I don't understand. Why do I hurt so bad? Why am I so uncomfortable? Why, 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 why? 37 chapters. Chapter 38, he finally stops asking why, and God says, Job, now I've got some questions for you. Chapters 38 and 39, God just barrages Job with questions that only God can answer. Where were you when I made the universe? Can you explain the law of gravity? That kind of stuff. For two chapters, God asks questions that obviously only He knows the answer to, and Job realizes after two chapters of listening to God's questions, who am I to question God? I'm just a man. My knowledge is limited. My brain capacity is too small. I know, wives, you're saying, wow, how did he get him to do that? If you could understand why God does everything he does in your life, you'd be God. So you don't understand it all. For me to try and understand the ways of God in the world is like an ant trying to understand the internet. No matter how hard an ant tries, he's never going to understand the internet. You don't have the capacity to understand God. There are things I just, don't, I just don't understand, but I have to trust Him. I don't understand it. They don't make sense, but I trust. So Job says, my knowledge is limited. I can't see it all. I'm just a man. So I stop questioning, and I'll start trusting. Job 42, beginning with verse 1. Then Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do anything and no one can stop you. In other words, you're sovereign. You are omnipotent. You ask, who is this that questions my wisdom with such ignorance? Job knows he's asking about him, so he can only say, it's, it's me, Lord. I don't understand and I've been questioning I was talking about things I didn't quite grasp. The situation was over my head, so I'll just trust you. What do you do when you're in a situation that you don't see what God sees? You can't see the whole picture. You just trust. In fact, Job would say this, Though he slay me, I will trust in him. Have you come to that maturity in your faith? Even if God kills me, I'll still trust in Him. That's a phrase that has helped me a lot as I deal with senseless tragedies. I see them all the time. I don't understand it. I don't know why it happens. I just have to trust. Number four. <laughs> refuse to become bitter. Job loses everything in his life in one 24-hour period, and this is what he says. I came naked from my mother's womb, and I'll have nothing when I die. The Lord gave me everything I have, and they were His to take away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You give and you take away, God. Blessed are you. God says Job didn't sin by blaming Him. Do you realize that grief is good? Grieving is good. Bitterness is bad. But grieving is good. Pain won't kill you. Bitterness will. Resentment prolongs the pain. It doesn't relieve it. It doesn't help it. It reinforces it. Grief is a good thing. But getting stuck in that grief and becoming bitter is not good. Men, we don't handle grief very well. Men, by nature, don't like sad feelings. In fact, we don't like feelings at all. We would rather just stay numb. 
When we feel a little bit of sadness, we start pushing it down deep inside and repressing it. But you need to realize that grief is a gift that God gives us. It is a tool that helps us through the transitions of life. It's how you move from one loss to the next chapter. You know, there's no growth without change. There's no change without loss. There's no loss without grief. You will have pain the rest of your life. You have to learn how to grieve well. God grieves. What's the shortest verse in the Bible? Jesus wept. See, come to trivia night. You know that question already. Jesus wept. He's grieving. The book of Ecclesiastes says there's a purpose and a time for everything. A time to be happy, a time to be sad. A time for what? Mourning or grieving. And there's a time for dancing. There's a time for everything. For Oh, we could go on and on. Now you're going to sing that song the rest of this lesson, but it's almost over. I want you to write this down. Get a pen, pencil, something. I don't think I put it on the screen. I should have. Write this down. Losses deepen me. They do not define me. Losses deepen me. They do not define me. A loss causes maturity in me. It does not define who I am. It's part of my maturity, not my identity. When you go through problems, God gives you grace. Enough grace for that moment. Tomorrow, He'll give you grace for tomorrow. But right now, you get enough grace for what you're going through right now. If you start worrying about something that's going to happen in 10 days from now, that's crazy. God's not going to give you grace today for something that's not going to happen for 10 more days. You're driving yourself insane. You're borrowing trouble. That's just dumb. Ask me. I know. When you're worrying, you're borrowing trouble, and you don't even have grace for it yet. When you get there in 10 more days, God will give you the grace to handle it. But you don't have the strength to handle it right now. It's killing you. It's destroying you. Carrying that weight is not what God wants for you. You're second-guessing. You're presupposing. You're being anxious. You're being fearful. Wait and let God help you handle it when it gets here. Be strong and courageous. That's our sermon series we're going through right now. Strong and courageous. If we can help you in your walk with Christ, we want to. In just a moment, we're going to sing a song of encouragement. If there's something private you'd like to help with, there's an office back over in this corner. Just go there. One of our shepherds will pray with you and help you. If it's more public, you can come to the front. Do that right now as we stand and as we sing. Good morning, church. Would you...